Good morning, bonjour, merci beaucoup. Uh, effectivement, j'ai commencé ma carrière en France. I started my scientific career in France, and, and uh, it was a pleasure for working for some time there. Thank you very much, uh, the organizers, for the invitation. And okay, let me start with some fundamentals and quantum dots. And I gave it title of a movie, actually a U.S. movie, same but different, same, same but different. So the title of the movie was, electronically, a quantum dot resembles an atom, and not a semiconductor, an atom in a dielectric cage. And that is the most important, that's, this is on the basis of the special properties of quantum dots. Now, what is a quantum dot? Because very often it's a little misused. It means that the lateral extension in all three directions of space are smaller than the de Broglie wavelengths of the charge carriers. Yeah? Fundamental physics lecture. But if there are too small, there are no bound states in quantum dots. This is actually in contrast to quantum wells where, where always you have bound states. You don't want to have them too large because you want to have the energy difference between these various sublevels in a quantum dot should be larger than kT at 300 Kelvin. Otherwise, you populate all the time the fundamental levels, the ground state and the excited states. So you have certain boundaries for the sizes and also for the morphology of coherent quantum dots. Now, a glimpse to prehistorical times. The subject is uh, precisely 30 years old, actually, and what we see here is not measles, but this is high voltage blem view transmission electron microscopy picture of indium arsenide, gallium arsenide quantum dots. And uh, I will later on start with looking at just one simple quantum dot. Now, the trigger of all the work was some PhD thesis at the Tokyo Institute of Technology by Asada which was published in 86, uh, 31 years ago or 30 years ago, and re it reported some modeling, which you see on the left-hand side here. Uh, he was modeling the gain, the material gain, as a function of the wavelengths for bulk quantum welds, quantum wires, and quantum dots for the gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, indium phosphide lattice match material system. And you see the bulk Goes, uh, the, the material gain, gain goes down, uh, goes up from 30 reciprocal centimeters to about 8,000. He did uh, similar calculations for the gallium arsenide material system, lattice match, gallium arsenide, gallium aluminum arsenide. And what you see here is on a double logarithmic scale, the maximum gain as a function of current density. And you see that the threshold current density was predicted for a three-dimensional material going down uh, from one kiloam per square centimeter down to about 45 amps per square centimeters for quantum dots. And these predictions, these theoretical predictions, uh, triggered enormous amounts of device work throughout the world. And uh, during about um, six or eight years of work, it never led to any 300 Kelvin devices. And we will see now why. The assumptions which were made at that time needed to be reversed. All the theoretical work was based on lattice-matched heterostructures, infinite barriers, just looking at one electron and one hole level and equilibrium uh, carrier distribution, a Fermi distribution. That was an unsuccessful technology. Infinite barriers is anyway incorrect. One electron, one hole level is incorrect, and equilibrium carrier distribution, Fermi distribution, it was at least uh, at lower temperatures incorrect, and is partly incorrect at room temperature. The result, the solution came by looking at surface physics. In surface physics, when you grow uh, layers of different chemical com com composition on top of e each other, uh, you, and, and they, are not lattice matched. They are not lattice matched now. Uh, strain in these non lattice matched heterostructures drives what we call today now quantum dot formation. Now, originally, we knew about two types of cross modes the layer by layer mode, when you have large surface energy, then you get a thin wetting layer. That is a so called van der Merwe cross mode. And when you have very large strained film energy, you get three dimensional clusters 
It's a Falmer Weber cross mode. Actually, Falmer was a professor of physical chemistry at my university, but before the Second World War. Now, a mixture of both is Transky Krastanov. You start with a thin wetting layer, and then after a certain thickness, let's say one and a half mono layers, you start with getting clusters, but coherent clusters, which are quantum dots. And here is a picture of uh, MOCVD crown indium galmorosinide, galmorosinide with 7% lattice mismatched. This is a transmission electron microscopy, a high voltage picture. And what you see is, is a, a square shaped quantum dot base. You see self similarity because of self organizations. It's the whole uh, growth process is driven actually by self organization. You have edges always parallel to 0, 0, 1. Sometimes you get actually ordering also along 0, 0, 1. So we have to replace old paradigms. Heterostructures must consist of materials with close to identical lattice constants, constant in order to be coherent and defect free. And that is, of course, for any photonic device, very important. You have to replace it by quantum dot heterostructure must consist of materials with largely different lattice constant in order to initiate strain-driven self-organization. Lattice mismatch is the driving mechanism. So we have now a completely new paradigms for the electronic properties. All carriers are strongly localized in typical volumes smaller than 10 to the third uh, cube nanometers. The energies of carriers are discrete delta functions, though that is atomic property and no solid state property anymore. That means that uh, following Heisenberg, carriers have no well-defined wave vector. There is no wave vector conservation, no recombination bottleneck, and that goes back to 1926, Heisenberg's uncertainty law. And that means, finally, that the recombination, due to the strong localization of carriers, is always excitonic or bioxytonic of origin. There is no free, so-called free carrier recombination. And that leads automatically to an enhancement of oscillator strength, something we like. And finally, for devices, index of refraction of the waveguide does not depend on gain of quantum dots. And that is a kind of removing Kramer's chronic law. And the old paradigms we know about, I, I think I don't read all of them. Yeah, we have energy of, as a function of wave vector, which is continuous, of course, and we have wave vector, wave vector and energy conservation. And finally, it's a, 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 the energy is a, gap is a function of chemical composition. And at higher densities, excitons are screened, and we have solely free electron hole recombination. Yeah, and that's all in contrast to what we know now for quantum dot based uh, uh, systems. And here I visualize a little the impact of dimensionality and I show you here um, uh, also the Hamiltonian uh, uh, and, and um, the, uh, the operator of the Hamiltonian of the, the momentum for um, three, 2D, 1D and 0D dimension. In one case it commutes, in the other case it doesn't commute. Square root, step function, one over uh, square root, and a delta function. Now, that is a very naive because, in actual fact, you have always broadening. For example, in quantum well, you have interface broadening, which smears out the, the step function, and so on. Not so the case in quantum dots. When you now populate uh, these uh, density of state functions with uh, a given amount of carriers, all these higher or, uh, dimensional systems look the same. Whether it's one dimensional quantum well or three dimensional, they look very similar except here. A quantum dot remains a quantum dot and it, re it remains a delta function, which has probably some lifetime broadening, Lorentzian broadening. And you can calculate the properties uh, using eight band, eight band K dot theory and the most important property, very funny wave functions, of course, uh, this one looks look still like S. Um, we have actually split P-bands, the holes look completely different. The most important property is, is all these energy states which, which we see here on the left-hand side, and there are plenty of them we calculated, 
all of them are just uh, twofold degenerate. Yeah? Like cross state of a hydrogen atom. Twofold degenerate, also the higher states. Yeah? There are twofold degenerates, all, all of them. And that makes this system, probably from a physical point of view, the most easy, simple system you can imagine. Now, are there any special applications of these unique properties? electronic and, proper and, and uh, optical properties. And I will talk about, during the remainder of my talk about security, single and production, fabrication of single and entangled qubits for quantum cryptography. And uh, I will explain you how you can fabricate uh, single quantum dot LEDs, which are just using one single quantum dot. And then I go to plenty of quantum dots, I use all of them which you see here, faster and more efficient, energy efficient, local area networks, metropolitan area, area networks, access networks, lasers and amplifiers, use the inhomogeneous distributions of many quantum dots and these devices, these photonic devices based on quantum dots are much more energy efficient than devices which are based on quantum welds. And of course, we could add a, a, a third chapter on visible LEDs and lasers based on gallium nitride, but we have many sessions on, the, on this subject here at uh, Photonics West. Now, uh, a few years ago, um, New York Times reported a, a cyber attack on a Saudi firm which disquiets United States. That was uh, uh, four and a half, a half years ago. Uh, that uh, stopped. Uh, that stopped uh, oil production in Saudi Arabia for a full day, yeah? And of course, uh, I read in the newspapers that cyber attacks on email accounts of uh, uh, one of the big American parties during the election campaign disquieted the headquarters a little. Now, what we have to talk about is uh, physical layer security. Now, classical cryptography started with Enigma. Enigma was... Uh, 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 a cryptography system which was used during uh, uh, the submarine warfare in the uh, Second World War. You have a secret message between Alice, somebody knows his face, Bob, and there are eavesdroppers. Probably I should have replaced the two pictures by two more recent ones from the uh, beginning of last week who were meeting a lady and a gentleman. Yeah, and uh, what I want to show you now is that single photon sources, qubit emitters, will play a decisive role in physical layer security. And uh, again, some quantum mechanics. Location and momentum cannot be independently determined. That is the background of a qubit, yeah? A measurement perturbs the system. This also uh, goes back to the 20s. Qubits cannot be duplicated. Our electrical engineer uh, invented a new name for that. They call it a non-cloning theorem. Measurement of the polarization state of a single photon disturbs or destroys the polarization. So essentially, it's a quantum mechanics which enables secure transmission of data. And what we want to have, the objective, is electrically triggered single photon sources which produce polarized single photons or entangled photon pairs for quantum repeaters in that case, and which should cost not more than a normal LED, let's say one, one dollar. Now, the realization is based on exactly the energy system of a single quantum dot I've shown in some of my previous slides. And you just embed uh, a single quantum dot in a cavity similar to a surface emitting laser, a Vixel. Yeah? And then you take advantage of the fact that the ground state of an electron hole pair is split by so called fine structure splitting in a pair of electronic states. And you can have now two types of transition, just two types of transition, that's all. Transition number one is you have an electron hole pair inside of the quantum dot, though you have maximum occupancy, 
which is two. Two electrons and two holes, and then you get what you call an excitonic molecule, similar to a hydrogen molecule. And that can decay, and the decay emits polarized light. And then from that, you go to the ground state, which is just a zero, yeah? Uh, by decaying, let's say, the, the, the single exciton decay. And then you can get uh, either one or two photons, which go to a receiver, yeah? And if you have zero fine structure splitting, which can be made by just uh, designing the correct size of the quantum dots, you have a single photon source or you have a, a source of entangled photons. And that is the first uh, realization, uh, 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 cooperation uh, we had with uh, the Russian Academy of Sciences in uh, Novosibirsk in Siberia. They fabricated a very low density of quantum dots and then we made an LED out of that. It's exactly 10 years ago that we made these first uh, devices. And what you see here is between 600 nanometers and uh, 1200 nanometers. And if you would use a higher resolution spectrometer, you see that this line is polarized. You can just see it here. Yeah, it's, it's a little polarized. Emission at one wavelength, 0 0.0 photons per uh, injected electron hole pair. Now the next challenge is of course side control. And uh, here you can invert the process which you use for Vixels. In Vixels, you grow active layer and then you put on top uh, an aluminum oxide arbiter. Now you can do it as a way round and you can uh, have a strain field then on top of the, you're going to have a strain field on top of the uh, aluminum oxide layer which attracts the indium atoms such that the quantum dot just form on top of this aperture. So you have a control of quantum dot position and that is essential for mass production. And now we look at Hembury Brown twist experiment, and you see that indeed you have a single photon emitter. Yeah? And that was actually by, uh, patented by uh, Stridmatter and uh, co authors, uh, this uh, uh, approach. Now, next step all that indium arsenide based material works at up to about 100 Kelvin. We want to have it at 300 Kelvin to reach our $1 goal. And we are on the way, we have some joint experiments with, uh, we did some joint experiments with Arakawa, and uh, we found that uh, you can have single, detect single light, uh, single cupid emission still at 300 Kelvin if you make similar uh, devices based on gallium nitride. And here is a picture uh, of a diode that you see, it's real life. You see a diode here, it's a diode structure, and. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can really see the pink spot here. Yeah, that is the emission of our single photon, which comes from the center here. Yeah, that is a single photon emitter, and uh, we used this approach, with, which I have shown in the previous slide. Now let's move to systems. Yeah, LANs, MANs, and access networks, and. Let's look whether we have any advantages by using quantum dot based devices uh, for systems. Now we need to know some facts about the internet protocol. Internet traffic, everybody knows, doubles uh, nearly every 36 months. And uh, what is most important that is that uh, about since one and a half years, Metro dominates, yeah? A long haul is the pink, yeah, here. And 2015, uh, Metro was taken over, yeah. And uh, 2017, uh, we see that the increase of, of long haul traffic is very small, but the increase is metro, metro traffic is, is extremely, star, uh, uh, extremely strong. And uh, one worry of many people who are thinking about our planet and our future is that this, the use of the internet, 6% uh, of the total power consumption in the United States today and worldwide 5% of total power consumption. 
That is about as much as we produce with solar energy. Yeah? The solar energy production is completely eaten up by internet use. Prediction is by um, systems people like Cisco and also university people that uh, until 2020, and 2020 is kind of tomorrow, right? It's very soon, in three years, eight times more than today without, if you would have no improvements. So we must really think about not only like in Olympic Games, faster, higher, etc., but less energy, yeah? When you jump higher, you should need, or, or run faster, you should need less energy. And that is a real challenge. Traffic increase creates contradictory challenges. We want to increase the data rates, but we want at the same time, at the same time, reduce the power consumption. Now, how does a semiconductor network look like? You have a transmitter, have a booster amplifier, inline amplifier, pre-amplifier, and a receiver. And I will talk about two of these subjects, about the transmitter and about the amplifiers. Let's first talk about a, a, a transmitter. It should have pico or sub-pico second pulse widths, tens of gigahertz repetition rates, repetition rate tuning, if possible, low pulse timing jitter. Timing jitter means that uh, each pulse, as compared on a time scale, as compared to the subsequent pulse, arrives really at the same time. Not only is narrow, but arrives at the same time. Temperature independent operation can be used, for example, for clock signal generation. And quantum dot lo mode lock lasers are probably the most preferential uh, solution for being faster and being more efficient, energy efficient. And we can do the same with amplifiers, to which I come back in the very last part of my talk. You want to have a small footprint, low cost at metro networks at 1.3, easy to integrate, multi-channel amplification, signal processing, so we, you want to have wavelength conversion, switching, regeneration, quantum dot optic, optical amplifiers. And the systems we use, the devices we use for both lasers and amplifiers are very simple. It's a classical uh, uh, 3.5 uh, semiconductor technology. We have uh, stacked, we have uh, stacked uh, uh, quantum dot layers. Uh, starting with the growing, starting with the gallium arsenide substrate, aluminum gallium arsenide cladding, and then we have five to 15 layers of indium arsenide, gallium arsenide um, uh, quantum dots, so called dot in a well approach, P doped, emission wavelengths 1290 to 1310, and that means the O band. And here you see one picture, a STM picture of one single quantum dot. And I'll show you now, we have, uh, next slide, a record low threshold current. That means we are really energy efficient with such lasers. And uh, we are also having a very large characteristic temperature, which is infinity, up to about 70, 75K. That means we don't need Peltier cooling. And actually, Peltier cooling costs more energy than uh, driving the laser. Then we have no filamentation, reduced RF noise, and a number of other very important uh, properties, which I not to discuss in detail, but I go to show you just one final uh, slide, uh, which was once uh, put together by my colleague Nikolai Ledensov from uh, Russia. Uh, showing on a semi-logarithmic scale the threshold current density as a function of the years. Double heterostructure, Alferov et al., which uh, gave him the Nobel Prize in the year 2000. Uh, continuous wave, Hayashi and Alferov at the same time, then we had the introduction of quantum welds. And finally, the first uh, quantum dot-based lasers were fabricated in my laboratory by PhD student Kirstetter, who is now head of a laser company in Berlin. And you see that we come down to below 10 amps per square centimeter for the threshold current density per quantum dot layer. Yeah? That means you can argue in two ways. Given the same current, you get a higher output. Or if you're fixed to a given output power, you are 
you need less current. Both are advantages which you may use now. Then for mode locked lasers, we have we need to talk about uh, we need to talk about uh, carrier capture. Carrier capture from either a reservoir, which is in gray on top here, down to the ground state, or from excited states. Now, the carrier capture from a reservoir is approximately 100 times faster than the capture from the excited state, and we don't need to regard to, to discuss that in, in, in detail. Yeah? So we have very ultra-fast femtosecond carrier capture I don't find the cursor, but probably can do it. We can do it without. We have fem femtosecond carrier capture nodes, a gain recovery. That is the most important. That means we have a very large region of stable mode locking compared to quantum welds. And then the real and imaginary part of refractive index are independent of each other. We don't need to uh, obey Kramer's chronic. And now we go to the inhomogeneously broadened spectrum which is composed of many, many homogeneously broadened lines. And that means that the broader the spectrum is, the shorter the pulses are, because the pulse width is a Fourier transform of the, li of the inhomogeneous line width uh, of the gain. Uh, of the gain yeah? That means more modes can be locked, and it's easier to produce picosecond or sub-picosecond sub pulses. And now I go to some uh, uh, the real devices which we fabricated with a Berlin company, which now belongs to Finisar, USQRT. A mode-locked semiconductor laser is something very simple. You have an absorber section and a gain section, monolithically integrated lateral absorber, and we have a defined phase rate rela relation between longitudinal modes, and then a, pump, a pulse comp is emitted. And we have two types of mode locking, essentially passive mode, li mode locking, uh, simple DC biasing, and you see now on, a, on this color scale, as a function of the absorber voltage and the gain current, you see the, the, the full width at half maximum, you see is a blue section produces the uh, narrowest pulse of all. Now you figure out that actually you have some chirp and you can compensate the chirp and then you come down with this approach to about uh, the area 600 femtosecond and a symmetric shape for optimized gain absorber length ratio. Output power of about 50 milliwatt for tapered waveguide structures. And you can go, until now, uh, was shown repetition rates between 5 and 88, 80, 87 gigahertz. However, we have an integrated time jitter in this, uh, in this uh, passive mode locked approach of several picoseconds. So it doesn't help so much to have a very, very narrow uh, uh, pulse width if the jitter is of, of, of less than a picosecond, if the jitter is a few picoseconds. Because what you're going to see is the jitter and not the pulse width. So what can we, can we do now? That is too large for many applications, and um, we um, found a very simple solution, which is optical self-feedback. A part of the mode-locked laser light is now injected back into the laser. We have a, a splitter, a beam splitter, a variable attenuator, a delay line, and then, you ha so we have a fiber-based loop, which is actually very inexpensive, yeah, and includes only simple and passive optical components. And the parameters are optical fiber lengths, delay, relative delay, and the feedback strength. These are the parameters you can uh, play with. Now, actually, optical self seed back was known to produce instabilities, because until recently, nobody really investigated this approach systematically. Yeah? Now, our detailed investigations, uh, Dian Arseniewicz, discovers islands of stability. And that is shown in the left picture, where for a certain uh, approach, we varied uh, the feedback attention, attenuation. If you focus uh, uh, down to the left-hand side, we have a, 
uh, a feedback attenuation which you can vary as a delay time. And then you measure the radio frequency power and you see this region 4, yeah? where you have a resonant optical uh, self-feedback region. And now you can measure the phase noise density on the right-hand side. And for the altogether five different regimes, you see, you look at the, you look at the blue curve. Well, okay, let's go here. Hmm. You have five different regimes. And you have a resonant regime number four, where you have electrical and optical significant improvement of the jitter. It goes down by, by, by more than one order of magnitude. For a given fiber length, which you can vary between here, we vary it between 60 meters and 120 meters, kept the attenuation constant, and found an optical length, uh, optim, uh, optimal length of 31 meters. Region 3 vanishes and region 4 extends to all relative delay values. Yeah? So we have a fantastic approach now. Uh, here you see now uh, the jitter of 219 femtoseconds instead of 3 to 4 picoseconds. A reduction actually as compared to the previous point by 94%. Uh, Electrical line widths a reduction by 99%. So these are record values for passively mode locked lasers. You can use that also, this approach, for microwave signal generations. And you can now extract the microwave, uh, microwave signal, let's say, at 40 gigahertz. If you compare now electrical and optical signal, you see they're identical. Yeah? So we have identical frequency and similar phase noise densities, very, or identical phase noise densities. So generation of optical and electrical microwave signals is at the same time typical, uh, possible with a very, very simple, with a very simple device. And now we create clock signals. And we have here, uh, between integration boundaries, let's say go to the lower case, which is a standard uh, ITU EHF band at 30 gigahertz. We have between 16 megahertz and 320 megahertz electrical jitter uh, 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 of 200 fem to second optical of 125. Yeah, and actually after compensating extraction losses, uh, 83 fem to seconds. So improvement is possible by increasing the extraction and conversion efficiency and optical feedback in enables now low cost and low jitter microwave generation. Uh, I'm a little running out of time and so I will kind of skip most of the hybrid mode locking par uh, part and uh, probably just showing you one or two results, uh, hybrid mode locking using subharmonic radi ra uh, radio frequency. We have generated here using subharmonic um, uh, sub uh, generation of the, uh, 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 we have generated repetition frequencies between 86 and 80, uh, around 87 uh, gigahertz. So this is the fastest two section mode locked laser and we have a complete mode locking below minus 5 volts, and the pulse rate width ranges again uh, from 1.4 to 3.1 picosecond. And then we can, uh, here we automatically have a record low jitter. And um, so this is the first uh, hybrid mode locked laser above uh, 43.5 gigahertz. These were the previously published values. And that is suitable for data transmission. And now I'll show you here data transmission experiments at 80 gigabit per second return to zero on off keying. We have here combined 40 gigahertz mod locked quantum dot mod locked laser combined with a Mach Zehner modulator and superimposed a PRBS7 in a return to zero scheme, two times OTDM, and now we get um, uh, 80 gigahertz uh, return to zero um, OK in a back-to-back -back configuration with an excellent signal-noise ratio of close to 12, 
and the root mean uh, square timing jitter of 452 femtoseconds. Now, finally, um, um, I want to show you that uh, trend in optical communication is using advanced modulation formats. Yeah, that means, for example, doubling of the bit rate at a given symbol rate, and one approach is differential quadrature phase shift keying. And we can now do, uh, drive, dual, use a dual drive Max Ender modulator to combine, combine with a phase modulator and a differential receiver based on the delay interferometer. And you see here 80 gigabit, gigabit uh, per second RZ DQPSK back to back, also with an excellent signal noise ratio. Yeah? And still no penalty after 45 kilometers. Yeah? And we have done the same at 160 gigabit per second, and we have excellent bit error rates uh, below 10 to the minus 10 you see here on the left-hand side. Finally, uh, two more remaining minutes, optical amplifiers. I mentioned already previously, I have shown this picture previously, uh, ultra-fast capture, which is, of course, very, very important for gain recovery. Real and imaginary part of refractive index are independent of each other, and we have this uh, broadened spectrum. Yeah? And we can do, of course, now do wavelength division multiplexing without crosstalk. And we can use the amplifier in linear and nonlinear applications. Why don't we have crosstalk? Uh, why don't we have no crosstalk? Well, these various ensembles of quantum dots, they don't talk to each other on a, let's say, one, pico, on a one picosecond time scale. It's the exchange with the, here, the area where you have, uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, 10 to the 20 uh, electrons and holes, yeah? But they do not talk to each other. And we have now a number of types of amplifiers, but at 1.3, very few. We have only Raman or semiconductor optical amplifiers, and here the quantum dots have huge advantages. We have a chip gain up to 35 dB, a very, very low gain ripple between 0.3 dB. We can have amplification at several data signals at a variety of wavelengths with neglectable crosstalk. And here I show you some results on reach extension. Uh, at 47, uh, 43, uh, 42.7 NRZ, oh, okay. And we see that uh, we have an error-free transition across 75 kilometers, a power penalty of 1 dB. Very, very small. Multi-channel amplification. At, three dif at four different wavelengths, we have uh, used uh, three times uh, 40 gigabit per second sources and one uh, 80 gigabit, gigabit per second source. And you see uh, a five nanometer grid. Power penalty below three uh, dB, up to minus six dBm input power per channel. Very low crosstalk for low input power and up, up, uh, error-free uh, amplification up to minus 3 dB and input power per channel. So quantum dot booster, quantum dot based booster SOAs are suitable for four wavelength channels, also at 80 gigabit per second. That means 320 gigabit per second. Yeah. Now, finally up and downstream. Usually, in such a network, you have an inline amplifier for upstream and an inline amplifier for downstream. Using quantum dots, you can throw out one of them and save 50% of the energy. One single device for bidirectional amplification, which means less components, less complexity, up to 50% reduced cost, reduce TEC power consumption cooling, and reduce driving power consumption. Yeah? And finally, very last, the two of modulation and multiplexing formats, which are going to be used or partially used already now for increasing the bit rate. And uh, one 
is multi-level. Another one is uh, multi-level where you use also phase. And I show you one simple result increasing the bit rate either you modulate the intensity on off keying. Yeah. You can introduce pulse code, pulse amplitude modulation, PAM4 is shown here. You can do the same using the phase, and that is uh, specific for quantum dot amplifiers, and you can combine both. Now you have quadrature amplitude modulation, yeah? And that is my final picture. You see here a constellation diagram before and after uh, the amplifier is a quantum dot amplifier. We have used, we had a data uh, signal of 40 gigabaut, and we used DQPSK, 80 gigabit per second, and the gain was 20, degree, uh, 20 dB for varying quantum dot SOA input signal power tested minus 12 to plus 9 dBm. That means error free amplification without signal degradation. So, finally, Summary. A quantum dot, keep in mind, is electronically an atom in a dielectric cage and not a semiconductor. Twofold degeneracy of energy levels, no dispersion. You have ultra fast gain recovery from the carrier reservoir, deep coupling of phase and gain, no interaction of quantum dot ensembles on short time scales, and that enables single and entangled photon emitters ultra-fast, jitter-free, energy-efficient mode-locked lasers, and energy-efficient semiconductor optical amplifiers operating in linear and saturating regimes at record bit and bound rates. Finally, a re reference to Lichtenberg, living in the 18th century, the inclination of human beings to appreciate small things as important has led to great achievements. Thank you very much for your attention.